Pirate Kingdom Media, Captain Tiny Pirate Gaming, Supplemental Log 09.16.22F. Or is it G? Oh, never mind. I'll sort it later. The important thing is that I have done it! Victory! The external hard drive has worked its magic. After two years of filming and analysis, I have successfully managed to compile and sort a collection of cluttered, grounded-themed, grounded-related notes and recordings from a small, unorganized file folder into a file folder with significantly more space that is, well, much more organized than it was before. Sparkle, make a note to come up with a better comparison. Nonetheless, this is a major accomplishment. However, it occurs to me that I have a new problem. All of this work was intended to be for a story theory video, but with Grounded 1.0 only like a week away, I'm, not, I'm just not sure there's enough time. What? So you're saying there's still time? What are we waiting for then? Quick, Sparkle, let's go! What up? It's me, Tiny Pirate Gaming, back with my last Grounded Game Preview video ever. Forever. 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 Because moving forward, this channel is going to be totally different. It's going to be all about Grounded 1.0, the full game, not a preview. I'll be covering new tutorials, new tips and tricks, secrets, cheeses, boss exploits, and probably more videos like this one where I explore the depths of Grounded's lore. Currently, our understanding of the lore in the Grounded Universe is limited to what we can observe in the gameplay set designs and props, and what we can discover from scattered collectibles in the form of tape recordings and notes. With this information as our evidence, let's examine everything we know so far about the story of Grounded. Up until the arrival of the playable protagonists Max, Willow, Pete, and Hoops, the story is all about a man named Wendell Tully. Oh yeah, right. Dr. Wendell Tully, and his pursuit to construct a shrinking machine, an endeavor that will end up costing him his job, his family, his health, and quite possibly his sanity, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. The only things we know about Wendell prior to August 31st, 1987, is that he's married to a woman named Trudy, he's fathered two children, a son named Thor and a daughter named Sarah, and he lives and works in the town of Brook Hollow at the headquarters of Ominent Practical Technologies, a corporation that employs scientists and engineers to develop new inventions for practical uses. We can assume he's been employed there for a while based off of the inventions he's created for them that were mostly turned down for further manufacturing by his director, something we'll be discussing in more detail later. For now, let's use the notes and recordings available to try and establish a chronology of events that will lead us up to the arrival of Grounded's main heroes, the four teenage protagonists. In a recording titled A New Idea from August 31st, 1987, Dr. Tully decides after another year of inventing failures to start up one of his old projects again, The Shrinking Machine. He decides to do this in secret at home in his basement, as opposed to at work in the Ominent Lab, most likely because his first attempt to produce the shrinking machine was shut down by his boss, director Dalton Schmechter, despite showing early signs of success. Take note of this because Ominent shutting down Dr. Tully's projects, despite them showing signs of success, is a trend we're going to see a lot of moving forward. This recording also introduces us to one of Dr. Tully's co-workers, a rival scientist named Dr. Klein, whose first name might be Kavinsky, and who is always discouraging Wendell's research. He'll become a little bit more important later on, but for now we only need to know that he and Wendell don't get along with each other very well. Anyway, in order to conduct his shrinking machine project in secret, Wendell activates another one of his old inventions, a robot named Burgle, to act as his lab assistant only a few days later on September 5th, 1987. Burgle is an interesting character who, like many other topics in this overview, is deserving of his own separate video because there's already a ton of interesting lore surrounding this rambunctious robot. But for now, all that matters is Burgle, originally invented to be a burger cook for the Roby's Burger chain of fast food restaurants, will be serving as Dr. Tully's lab assistant. And again, it's worth remembering here that Burgle, much like the shrinking machine, was another of Wendell's seemingly successful projects that was shut down by his ominent employers. This is despite the fact that we know Burgle is already a fully functional automaton with an advanced AI capable of independent motor functions, learning, thinking, and emotions. 
Now that's some pretty advanced technology for the 1980s. Anyway, for a few months, Dr. Tully and Berg will work on the shrinking machine in Wendell's basement until December 19, 1987, when the covalent space reducer prototype is completed. Wendell names it the Spacer, and unfortunately, the first test of the machine is a total failure. But all is not lost, because only a few days later, on December 23rd, Dr. Tully is able to use the spacer to successfully shrink a set of basic plastic polyhedral dice from the size of standard dice to no bigger than the size of, well, much smaller dice. We also learn from this recording a bit about Wendell's son, Thor, for whom the dice were intended for as a Christmas gift. If you combine this with the existence of the Minotaurs and Myrmidons tabletop game found in the backyard, we can safely assume that Thor is a fan of the Grounded Universe's equivalent to Dungeons and & Dragons. And Wendell mentions Brook Hollow's local toy store, the Fun Pit Toy Mart, which is also where the yoked girth action figures are sold, according to the carton for one of them that can be found in the trash pile. What do either of these things have to do with the story? Well, nothing right now, but they might be important later. For the next several months leading into 1988, Dr. Tully continues researching and presumably testing the spacer. During this time, he discovers that a small number of particles are not being conserved during the size changing process, but upon observing no ill side effects, he disregards these particle anomalies for now. Like many other plot points in these data logs, these non-conserved particles foreshadow the eventual discovery of raw science and the future side effects of size changing that Dr. Tully will experience firsthand when he begins using the spacer on himself. Another key piece of evidence in this recording from May 1929, 1988 mentions Dr. Klein again and reveals that Dr. Tully has informed Dr. Klein of the success of his secret spacer project. Although Dr. Klein dismisses the claim, this decision by Dr. Tully would prove disastrous in regards to his future employment at Ammon and Practical Technologies. This is because Dr. Klein tells Ammon about the project, and on June 23, 1988, Wendell's bosses request a demonstration of the spacer. This initially delights Dr. Tully, who is eager to show off his functional shrinking machine. However, on July 1st, 1988, with his boss, Director Dalton Schmechter, in attendance for the demonstration, the spacer malfunctions, totally ruining Wendell's credibility as a scientist in the eyes of his peers and, more importantly, his employers. I also find it amusing that the attendees to the demonstration use peeper goggles to view the test, which showcases that at least one of Dr. Tully's projects wasn't entirely shut down by Ominent. It's also worth noting here that Director Dalton, the guy who initially shut down Wendell's shrinking project at Ominent, is in attendance when the spacer malfunctions. Isn't that weird? Because we already know that the spacer has been working leading up to this demonstration, so this is just something to keep in mind for later. A couple months after the failed spacer demonstration on September 5th, 1988, Ominent fires Dr. Wendell Tully, which forces him to start substitute teaching at the local high school. Fun side note here, you can actually find the termination letter from Ominent in the trash pile biome while exploring the yard. It's also interesting that Dr. Tully is working at the local high school, which could point to a possible connection between Wendell and the four playable protagonists who happen to be high school aged teenagers. Nonetheless, Wendell's termination from Ominent concludes really the first chapter of Grounded's prequel story and sets up the next era of Dr. Tully's life, which I call the success of Spacer. It's during this time, between January and October of 1989, that Wendell truly starts to unlock the secrets of his Spacer project and eventually discovers the existence of raw science which appears to be a byproduct of the size-changing process and correlates in some way to the missing particles not being conserved that Dr. Tully believes to be responsible for the spacer's malfunction during the demonstration. It's also during this time that Wendell starts to become more distant to his family with most of his time being spent between his day job as a teacher and his spacer experiments at night. Oh, and he also starts using the spacer to shrink himself, indicating he's unlocked the secret to restoring trunk objects to their original size, but we'll touch more on that again later. Because it's not until January 4th, 1989, three months since losing his job at Ominent, that he decides to start working on the spacer again. And only two months later, he manages to isolate the source of the spacer's transcription irregularities in the form of a new particle that he classifies as irregular covalent SNPI-42Z, or as it's more commonly known, raw science. 
Following this recording, there is a significant time gap in our dated evidence, but it can be assumed that during this time, and with the help of the newly discovered raw science particle, Dr. Tully figured out how to unshrink things using the spacer. We can also assume that during this time gap is when he felt comfortable enough with the spacer's stability to begin using it on himself quite regularly as a way to expand his research more. The reason I say this is because the next recording from Dr. Tully is dated August 10th, 1989 and is titled Lab Modules and in it we get the sense that Wendell's already used the spacer to change his own size. Dr. Tully details his plans to use the borrowed lab modules taken from Aminit to set up a miniature series of laboratories in his backyard for further experimentation with raw science while he is shrunk. What's really interesting about these lab modules is that they were another one of Wendell's shutdown inventions initially designed to be part of a toy set for children. However, despite their less than perfect manufacturing designs, Dr. Tully notes in this recording that he was surprised to discover Ominent was still using the idea, but in a very different way. We're never explicitly told in what way Ominent was using the labs, but considering that when we visit them during the game, we discover them to be fully functional miniature laboratories, it can be speculated that Ominent had turned them from just a child's playset into an actual lab. Why, why would Ominent do that? Not only did they shut down Wendell's science toy project while he was employed by them, but they continued experimenting on his ideas after he was fired. It sort of makes you wonder what other ideas Ominent seemingly stole from Wendell. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Anyway, Dr. Tully moves the spacer to his backyard and sets up his miniature science centers and field stations and begins shrinking himself to conduct experiments inside of them when he's not working as a teacher. However, due to the activities of his children, the hedge lab suffers serious damage when it gets struck by a flying disc, highlighting Wendell's concerns with Ominent's manufacturing. This also breaches the lab and allows spiders to infiltrate, which will have both positive and negative consequences in the near future. But for now, it prompts Dr. Tully to start reprogramming Tasty Robots for defense. We're never told for sure, but the Tasty Bots appear to have been additional lab assistants at first, but due to the lab breach, they were converted into combat drones to first defend the damaged lab and will later be used to harvest resources from the local wildlife. It's also safe to assume at this point that Dr. Tully and Burgle are spending more time shrunk and working in their miniature lab modules or traversing across the backyard. Which is presumably what prompts Dr. Tully to begin designing some of the shrunken survival technology that will be used by the playable protagonists when they arrive in the yard. The reason I speculate about this is because in our next recording from September 4th, 1989, we learn that Dr. Tully has become frustrated about the travel time while tiny and the spider infestation getting increasingly worse in the Hedge Lab. It's also at this time that Dr. Tully's scientific pursuits are driving a wedge between himself and his family, as is evident in a recording titled Zip It from September 7th, 1989. In this recording, we learn that Trudy, Wendell's wife in case you forgot, forced him to take a break from his work to spend a day with his family at a local water park. Wendell reluctantly agrees to go, but while at the park, he remains focused on his research, ignoring time with his family, and instead obsessing over one of the water park zipline attractions while he brainstorms how to use it to solve his tiny travel transportation troubles. On September 15th, 1989, in a recording titled, A Little Exhausted, Dr. Tully details updates regarding the Spacer project, detailing that he's found a way to contain raw science particles, and that he and Burgle have spent extensive amounts of time while tiny with no observable side effects. However, in this same recording, it's revealed that Trudy was starting to notice new wrinkles and thinning hair on Wendell, but it is assumed that stress is the cause due to his work as a substitute teacher by day and a shrunken scientist by night. Unfortunately, as we'll soon learn, these are likely the first symptoms of the spacer's side effects caused by the irregularities in raw science particles created during the size changing process, which we'll learn are possibly highly mutagenic. A recording titled Damage Control from September 21st, 1989 sees Dr. Tully continuing his research into zip lines in the Hedge Lab, but we learn that the costly price of steel cable has prompted him to start experimenting with the spider webs that are left over from the spider infestation. We also learn that another thrown toy into the Hedge has further damaged the lab, which results in Wendell forbidding his children from playing in the yard, further emphasizing the void forming between Dr. Tully and his family. This is also the only evidence that mentions Dr. Tully's daughter, Sarah, 
Not sure if that's significant to the story in any way, but I made a note of it, so do what you want with that. Now this is where things start to get interesting, or where some would say the plot thickens. Because in a note from September 22nd, 1989, titled Re-Reboot, we learn that Dr. Tully's activities are being watched by someone or something. You see, Dr. Tully was very close to unlocking a way to use spiderweb as an alternative material for his zipline project, but he likely needed more spiderweb to continue his research. Or he needed some other resource from the yard, we're not told exactly why he does this, but we do know that this is when he installs the resource surveyor system that the playable protagonists are able to use later on. Initially, the surveyors were used by the tasties that had been programmed and modified to harvest resources from around the yard. However, when Dr. Tully reboots the surveyor system, he detects 19 unexplained radio signals that he suspects to be coming from Ominent. The discovery of these radio signals is what triggers Dr. Tully to install the biometric security systems onto all of the labs around the yard. After this event, research with the web samples continues until October 11th, 1989, when Dr. Tully discovers a way to use raw science and spiderwebs to create a cable for his zipline project that's extremely soft and light, but is just as strong as steel. It's during this time that Dr. Tully starts to realize that raw science can be used as a catalyst for mutation, and moving forward, this becomes the primary focus of his research and experiments. For now, however, this ends the second chapter of Grounded's prequel story, which was a relatively successful time period for Spacer research. Unfortunately, this third chapter in Dr. Wendell's journey is not as successful because we're about to find out that those physiological signs of aging that Trudy noticed a few months ago were not stress-related, but were actually likely side effects of using the spacer on himself. We learn about this in a recording from October 15th, 1989, titled, Conveniently Enough, Side Effects, where Wendell reveals that after a visit to the local doctor, Dr. Applebaum, that his biological age has increased rapidly and that he has physiologically aged over 20 years in the time he's been using the spacer. Once this is learned, Trudy requests that Wendell stop his experiments for the sake of his health, but Wendell instead decides to continue his research for the sake of his legacy, even if it costs him another 20 years of his life. This is the point when Dr. Tully becomes totally obsessed with his science and that the void between himself and his family is cemented ever further. We'll also witness moving forward that he becomes fascinated by the transformative properties of the raw science particles as he desperately tries to find a way to reverse the accelerated aging affecting his body. By these two factors combined is why I call the third chapter of Grounded's prequel, Mad Science, Goodbye Wendell. This period truly begins on October 29th, 1989, when Dr. Tully abandons the hedge lab following a confrontation with a broodmother spider. Before completely evacuating the hedge lab, he has Burgle lock down the lab security and then encrypt all of the data in the mainframe. This is done because aside from the broodmother, he also believes that someone, probably Ominent, is watching them. After abandoning the hedge, Dr. Tully next moves to the pond, where he plans a new experiment that will use the nutrient-rich soils of the pond substrate to foster growth. And by November 21st, 1989, he's begun his next experiment, the HAMS test. HAMS is an acronym that stands for Automated Hydroponic Aquaculture Microponic System and will focus on growing super nutrient-rich Brussels sprouts. Our next piece of evidence comes in the form of a note titled Pipe Problems from November 29th, 1989. In this note, we're told that Trudy hired a lawn service company to fix the sprinkler system, which angers Dr. Tully, who insists that he could fix it himself when he had more time. However, the company that arrives, Scapes Amalgamated, is unknown to Dr. Tully, and during their visit, Wendell catches them working near the pond, nowhere near the sprinklers. Wendell eventually shoes them off and attempts to fix the pipes himself, but while digging, he damages the pipes even more, further complicating the issue. But rather than fix the pipes, he decides to blame the plumbers and then leaves the sprinkler system inoperable, in favor of working on his shrunken science. Fun thing to note here is that this unknown company wasn't focused on fixing the sprinklers when they first arrived, and instead seemed to focus on the pond. 
Coincidentally, this is around the same time that Dr. Tully has begun doing research in the pond and also suspects that he is likely being monitored by his former employers. Oh, also those boot prints that can be found around the yard? They might be from these sprinkler repairmen based off of the way Wendell describes them stomping around the yard in this note. Based off of the dates and the discovery points for these next recordings and notes, it is highly likely that Wendell was working in both the pond and Hayes Labs at the same time during this time period. Following the sprinkler incident, Dr. Tully continues the hams test in the pond lab, but discovers that the Brussels sprouts aren't growing properly and are very loose and limp. We also learn that Trudy has thrown her wedding ring into the pond, a telling sign that Dr. Tully's devotion to his science has cost him his family at this point, but more on that shortly. Because on the back of the note titled Ham's Test Day 7 is a very strange poem. The only reason I bring this up is because this poem is unlike anything Wendell has produced so far and could potentially point towards Dr. Tully suffering additional psychological side effects due to the spacer and the raw science, as will be alluded to later on. Unfortunately, Wendell fails to mend his relationship with Trudy, and on November 30th, only two days after throwing her ring into the pond, Trudy takes the kids and moves in with her sister, indicating that a divorce is imminent. In the letter she leaves for Wendell, Trudy explains that his science has driven him too far from his family and that his declining health condition, caused by the spacer's side effects, are too much for her and the kids to handle anymore. This is when Dr. Tully truly starts his mad science experiments because between December 6, 1989 and May 9, 1990, Dr. Tully starts using the raw science to create mutant fungus and mutant Brussels sprouts in the hopes of finding a way to reverse the abnormal side effects altering his body. Our next piece of evidence is a bit of a mystery because it's not dated and it doesn't appear in the data tab of the menu. It can only be observed when it is first discovered in the Hayes lab. From it, we learn about Dr. Tully's experiments related to mushrooms and how this research is directly focused on trying to find a way to reverse or subdue the rapid aging side effects of the spacer. Wendell expresses in this recording his hopes that this experiment can get him back to his old self again so that he can finish the spacer, get his job back at Ominent, and restore his relationship with his family. Burgle can also be heard on this recording hinting that Dr. Tully might be experimenting on himself with the mushroom research, which could potentially explain some of Wendell's unusual behavior as was first seen with the fish poem on the back of the Ham's Test research note. There's also this really weird whiteboard in the back of the Hayes lab that depicts diagrams of talking edible mushrooms that I'd like to cite as further evidence of Dr. Tully's unusual behavior. On December 6, 1989, Dr. Tully returns to the pond lab to check on the progress of the hams test, and in an attempt to make the Brussels sprouts less limp, he decides to use raw science to splice the Brussels sprouts with the muscular and vascular systems of a creature. In order to do this, he has Burgle retrieve a jarred appendix, and the final result of this experiment is the creation of the muscle sprout, which you're probably familiar with from playing the game. Dr. Tully also, oddly enough, begins using rhythmic music to try and stimulate further growth from these muscle mutant sprouts. One day after the creation of the muscle sprouts, Burgle begins testing how to use them to prepare meals and ultimately determines through his robo-cooking research that they can nutritionally be used as a meat substitute and they taste like onions. This is the first of Burgle's side projects to be mentioned, but based off of a whiteboard that can be found in the hedge lab, it seems that Burgle may have also been conducting his own side research before using the berries, but we're not sure exactly what he was doing. Anyway, Burgle also mentioned in his test kitchen note that the muscle sprouts fight for their lives during preparation, which indicates that these half appendix, half Brussels sprouts mutant veggies are very much alive. Next, we fast forward to December 21st, 1989 and return to the Hayes Lab experiments on mushrooms with a note titled, Phase 3 Results. It seems that the mutated mushroom experiment has gotten out of hand and has spread to the local creatures and fungus, mutating it all into highly explosive monsters. This explains why the Hayes biome is the way that it is when the playable protagonists arrive. Despite this disaster, this convinces Dr. Tully that his suspicions about raw science being a catalyst for growth are accurate. Keep in mind here that it's very possible that the mutations affecting the wildlife around the Hayes lab could also be impacting Dr. Tully himself, who's already experiencing the accelerated aging effects of the spacer. This next recording can only be observed upon first discovering it in the Hayes lab, and it is not dated and does not appear in the data tab. 
I decided to place it here chronologically because it deals directly with the explosive infected mutations and it gives us more clues regarding Dr. Tully's declining health. In this recording titled Blazed Earth Protocol, Dr. Tully abandons the Hayes lab because the infectious explosive fungus has escaped the lab and spread to the surrounding region of the yard. Burgle is also ordered to blow a hole in the weed killer spray bottle before the Hayes lab gets entirely locked down. Dr. Tully also comments on his own condition and describes himself as a baby toe after a long bath, so presumably very wrinkled. This recording also indicates that all of the creatures and fungus surrounding the Hayes lab have been mutated by the infection at this point, making it too unsafe for continued research. What I find interesting about this is that blowing a hole in the weed killer sprayer appears to have been done as a means of containing the spread of the Hayes infection. The only reason I say this is because when the playable protagonists arrive later and plug up the weed killer bottle with a piece of chewing gum, it seals off the spray and causes the infection to spread into other regions of the yard. On December 27th, 1989, Dr. Tully returns to the pond lab to continue the ongoing hams test and we learn that he started incorporating fungus into the experiment. Interesting. We're also shown that the mutant muscle sprouts are growing rhythmically and responding like flesh and muscles to the music being played in the biodome. Dr. Tully envisions the muscle sprouts as an answer to world hunger because of their dense nutritional value and decides to incorporate actual aerobics themed, aerobics related videos on the lab monitors in the biodome to further improve the growth of these mutant crops. You can even see these monitors and listen to the rhythmic music in the game when you visit the Pond Labs biodome. Next, we jump to February 20th, 1990 with another note related to the hams test. In this note, we learn that Dr. Tully failed to pitch the idea of using muscle sprouts as a food alternative to the Mouthtown Corporation because the muscle sprouts couldn't survive the de-shrinking process. This is noted as being connected to the rapid aging side effects of the size changing process. We also learn that Burgle is able to prepare delicious meals using the muscle sprouts at miniature size, further frustrating Wendell that the crops can't be resized. And just in case you're wondering what the Mouthtown Corporation is, well they're the company responsible for the puncho drinks and the soda beverages that can be found scattered around the yard. What I find most weird about this note is that Wendell doesn't seem to correlate the aging of the muscle sprouts during the growth process with his own accelerated aging process, which again appears to be a side effect of using the spacer. Matter of fact, in this note, Wendell acts as if he's not experiencing any ill side effects at all. Isn't that weird? Is this further evidence of Dr. Tully's declining health, or is it just a game preview chronology error since the full game hasn't, you know, been released yet? You decide, let me know in the comments. Fast forward now to March 29th, 1990 with a note titled Mixer Relocation Program, which outlines that Dr. Tully has positioned the mixer units around the yard to act as a diversion for the hostile creatures and keep them away from his labs. This note also mentions that something other than the local hostile wildlife has been attempting to get into the labs, but we're not told exactly what that something is. Could it be the miniature mutant monster man from the trailer? Probably not, but I do have a theory about that thing that I'll be talking about in a little bit. The last recording we have from Wendell comes from May 9th, 1990, and in it we can hear an exhausted and defeated Dr. Tully requesting Burgo to play the old Roby's Burger script, which the robot cheerfully does. From this point forward, the only evidence we have to work with is what's been revealed by the Grounded 1.0 trailer and what we can experience while playing through the game with the playable protagonists. We know from the trailer that at some point between this final recording and the arrival of Max, Willow, Pete, and Hoops that other teenagers in Brook Hollow have also gone missing recently. I presume that Ominent is responsible for this and that they've been shrinking down teenagers from the local high school and depositing them in Dr. Tully's backyard. The main reason I say this is because of the Ominent constructed shrunken person case that the playable protagonist awaken outside of after presumably being miniaturized at the start of the game. This case is made by Ominent, and based off what we know about Wendell up to this point, he wouldn't need this type of device for two main reasons. He can shrink and de-shrink things, so what good would this do when it's only him and Burgle doing experiments anyway? And two, he's so wrapped up in trying to fix his health condition with the raw science that he'd have no time to worry about designing a shrunken person carrying case. He couldn't even find the time to fix the sprinklers. Anyway, the playable portion of Grounded Story kicks off right here when the four shrunken teens awaken outside of one of those carrying cases and begin their adventure through the yard. 
They discover that they've all been equipped mysteriously with scabbies that give them access to Dr. Tully's technology and allow them to access the biometric security systems of the shrunken science centers around the yard. After failing to activate the mysterious machine in the hopes of restoring their size, they eventually make their way to the Oak Lab and meet Burgle. Burgle fills them in a little bit about what's going on and reveals that Dr. Tully's not only gone missing, but also that his memory chips have been removed and scattered around the labs of the yard. Without those memory chips, Burgle can't remember how to fix the spacer and therefore can't restore the teenagers to their normal size. The heroes then go on an epic crusade across the yard, visiting all of Dr. Tully's labs, defeating dangerous creatures, and using Dr. Tully's recipes and inventions to master shrunken survival techniques until they manage to retrieve and return all of the memory chips to Burgle. With all of the memory chips returned to Burgle, it's revealed that to fix the spacer and get back to normal size, they will need an embiggening cell to fuel the machine. Unfortunately, Dr. Tully, fearful of his technology falling into the wrong hands, erased the final ingredient from Burgle's memory entirely, leaving them all stranded and shrunken in the backyard until Tuesday, when the full game is released and we get to find out the rest of the story. And that's basically the entire grounded story so far as revealed through what's available to us in the game preview. So if that's what you wanted to know, then I hope you enjoyed it and thank you so much for watching. Because now, we're moving on to Theory Time. Tiny Pirate Gaming Theory Time. Theory Time! Theory Time! Theory Time! These are theories about Grounded 1.0's story. Theory Time! Theory Time! Theory Time! I'm only making educated guesses, but they might turn out to be true. Theory Time! Theory Time! Theory Time! If you don't want things possibly spoiled for you, then you better get out of here right now. Theory time, theory time, theory time. Ominent never stopped working on Wendell's original shrinking machine back when director Dalton Schmechter shut down Dr. Tully's first spacer project. They just moved it to a different department or something. This is why they made the tiny functional labs out of the toy concepts from Dr. Tully's Kinder Science toy chemist set because they got the original spacer prototype to work and most likely shrunk some of their own staff. But Ominent doesn't know how to reverse the shrinking process because Dr. Tully never discovered that until after being fired. But since Ominent was spying on Wendell, they know that he knows how to unshrink things, so they let him steal the lab modules to continue spying on his experiments in the hopes of finding out the secret. But Dr. Tully catches on to them when he's setting up the resource surveyor for the Tasty Harvesters, and he sets up stricter security protocols on his research to hide what he's doing. This brings us to the missing teenagers and eventually to our playable protagonists. Because Ominent, knowing Dr. Tully is a substitute teacher at the local high school, has been shrinking down students and equipping them with scabbies before dropping them into Wendell's yard in the hopes of forcing Dr. Tully to reveal the de-shrinking secret when he tries to save them. Based off the number of shrunken skeletons found around the yard, up until Max, Willow, Pete, and Hoops, the teens hadn't been faring so well at shrunken survival. What Ominent probably doesn't know is that Dr. Tully hasn't perfected the de-shrinking process, as we learned from the notes, because there seems to be an age-related physiological change that occurs during the de-shrinking process. These side effects appear to be related to raw science, which Dr. Tully's discovered to be highly mutagenic. In fact, I think it's so mutagenic that the mutant monster man from the trailer is actually Dr. Tully himself, transformed into a muscle sprout fungus mutant due to his experiments with raw science. Either that, or Dr. Tully has gone full mad scientist and is using infected fungus and muscle sprouts to grow a miniature military of monsters equipped with exploding fungus bioweapons to conquer the world. But hey, that's just a theory, a tiny pirate gaming theory. Thanks for watching, and... See ya, chump. Wait, 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 wait. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Because if you're a fan of Grounded-themed, Grounded-related content presented in a random YouTube video format, then you found the right channel, because that's basically all that I do here. So if that interests you, then defeat the like button with a powerful thrust kick, and then a 3 hit combo, and then after it's down, you know, just, just kick it again. And I hope that this video earned your subscription today. And thank you again so much for watching. Until next time. Alright, matey. Watch your step. There be a tiny pirate here.
We also get a mention about Brook Hollow's local toy store, the Fun Pit Toy Mart, which is also where the yoked girth action figures are sold, according to the carton of one of them, the carton for one of them, that can be found in the trash pile. It's also worth noting here that Director Dalton, the guy who initially shut down Wendell's shrinking project at Ominent, is in attendance when the spacer malfunctions. So that's the line. And by November 21st, 1989, he's begun his next experiment, the hams test. <coughs> 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 Did you just record all that? The last recording we have from Wendell comes from May 9th, 1990, and in it we can hear an exhausted and defeated Dr. Tully requesting Burgle to play the old Roby's Burger script, which the robot, he does it. Uh, 